Located at the top of Wisconsin, Bayfield County is considered by many of the locals to be the wild side of the dairy state. This is a place of majestic beauty with national treasures that include the Apostle Islands, the natural wonders of its sea caves, and rugged sandstone cliffs that frame the clear waters of Lake Superior. This is Bayfield County Wild. Hello everyone, I'm Nancy Christopher and I'm joined by my co-host Mary Motif, Director of Bayfield County Tourism. Welcome to spring, Mary. Yes, welcome. It's been quite a winter here in Wisconsin. How many inches would you say we got, Mary? Well, the funny thing is, a lot of people measure in inches, but in Bayfield County, we are measuring in feet. Oh, (laughs) you're right. I should have asked. (laughs) How many feet have you had? (laughs) Well, all I know is we had over two feet just in February alone, so we've had our share. Well, this time of year when the snow is finally starting to melt, the rivers and streams are really running fast and higher than usual. So this is a really great time to hike and check out the waterfalls in Bayfield County. How many waterfalls are there in this area, Mary? So in Bayfield County, there are five waterfalls, but in the greater, you know, northern Wisconsin area... When you're talking about like the four counties along Lake Superior, Douglas County, Bayfield, Ashland County, and Iron County, there are over 20. Wow. Yeah. So Iron County has the most, Bayfield County is the next, and then Douglas and Ashland each have a couple of really nice waterfalls. And what waterfall is the highest? So the highest waterfall is in Douglas County. It's called Big Manitou Falls. And it's 165 feet. So it really is a big waterfall for us, at least in the Midwest. I think I read somewhere that it's only like two feet shorter, or if you call it that, than Niagara Falls. It's pretty big. It really is. It's really worth a visit. It's pretty cool. And all of these waterfalls are. So if you like waterfalls, I would recommend making that a goal is getting to all of these waterfalls. If you can't do it all in one year, spread it out over a few years. But it's a great reason to get out and about. But up in that area, how much terrain are we talking about? How many miles from each other is everything? Well, you know, that's all in a four-county area that we're talking about over 20 waterfalls. So you could do all of that in a week for sure if you're going to make a big trip out of it all in one shot. Mm -hmm. And some of them you can do in one day if you're going to hit, you know, two within a county or something like that. So it just depends on how much time you have. What about picturesque waterfalls. What would you say are your most picturesque? You know, each one is so different. The two that come to mind are Lost Creek Falls, which is where you walk in about a mile and a half through the forest. And then it's just this opening in the forest with this beautiful waterfall. And now it's it's not a huge waterfall, but it's just so gorgeous. And you can actually walk behind the waterfall. You can kind of tiptoe over to the, the rocks behind and, and go behind the water. And it's just a really special place. And then Houghton Falls is on a path on the way out to Lake Superior. And so it's just another really awesome scenario that I would highly recommend. And there are a few others too. So They're all wonderful if you like waterfalls. Are they hard to find? Some of them are a little bit hard to find. I guess I say that, but hesitatingly, because they're marked, you know, the trails are marked to get to the waterfalls. And so you have to know that you want to get there and you you have to kind of do a little looking ahead of time to know where you're going. But um, once you're there, they're clearly marked. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I understand you have a new brochure that's out that features these waterfalls. What kind of information can we find in the brochure? So actually, you'll find information about all four of those counties that I mentioned and their waterfalls. And there's a map now in this new version, which is great because it shows you literally where all of these waterfalls are throughout that four county area. And then there are descriptions on each of the waterfalls with some contact information for more information. There's some beautiful pictures of the waterfall so you can get a sense of what you're going to find. And it's just a really helpful little publication. So you can order that online at TravelBayfieldCounty.com. It's one of the publications we have there that you can check when you're filling out the form to have information sent to you. And hopefully we'll have it online soon, too. All right. Well, thank you. I'm sure our next guest has hiked many of those trails and and visited those falls while doing what he loves most, which is birding, right, Mary? Right, that is for sure. So when we come back, we're going to talk to Ryan Brady, so don't go away. 
Looking for a unique adventure? Stay at one of Bayfield County's rustic and cozy yurts, located near the towns of Bayfield and Cable, and enjoy all that nature has to offer. Explore thousands of acres of Bayfield County forest and enjoy endless miles of exceptionally maintained, non-motorized recreational trails. Prepare to relax, unwind, and explore the wonders of the Northwoods, and then gather around the fire for a quiet evening with the sounds of the forest and a view of the stars surrounding you. These yurts are very popular, so book early. Reserve one at Airbnb or email yurts at Bayfield bayfieldcounty.org with questions. Located on the shore of Lake Superior, near the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, the Apostle Islands, and Big Top Chautauqua, the Quality Inn gives you plenty of opportunities to enjoy outdoor activities and adventures. Begin your day with a satisfying breakfast in the Lake Rock Cafe, which offers a convenient breakfast to go for those who have a busy, action-packed day ahead of them and are pressed for time. At the end of the day, you can unwind and have a drink in the lounge. Guest rooms feature premium bedding, a flat-screen TV, refrigerator, microwave, coffee maker, hair dryer, and desk. Rooms with sleeper sofas, a lake view, and poolside rooms are available. If the weather doesn't cooperate, the indoor swimming pool and whirlpool are great places to relax. Enjoy the combination of friendly service and comfortable accommodations at the Quality Inn Hotel in Ashland. Reserve your room today. You can find the Ashland Quality Inn on Facebook or at choicehotels.com. Welcome back to Bayfield County Wild. This may surprise you, but did you know that birding is the world's number one sport? According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, there are 51.3 million birders in this country alone. Here to talk about why it's so popular in Bayfield County is Ryan Brady, a conservation biologist and bird monitoring coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I love talking about birds. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> How did you get into birding? You know, it started early in life. Um, yeah, like for many people, I think, you know, your parents introduce you to a lot of things you, you love later on. And, and for me, it was, you know, trips out in the woods. I actually grew up in a fairly urbanized area, a suburb of Philadelphia. And we always took trips out to different parts of the state or city parks to, to get into the wilds. And you see birds when you're out there. And, uh, it just was one of those things where it slowly grew on me, and by the time I was in high school, I was not only really into the outdoors, but I was really into looking at birds, and, and then I came to Northland College, which is located in Ashland, and for my advisor there, they connected me with the bird guy, Dick Virch, who many people locally will know, and from there, it's just been a full-on addiction ever since and turned into a profession, and, and I'm just doing all birds most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty interesting being so passionate about birding when you grew up in the city. That's interesting. Well, I think it makes those trips to the outdoors even more special, you know, when it's not right in your backyard. Yeah, probably. I'm, right. I'm very happy right now that I have so much right at my fingertips, and we'll talk about some of that, I'm sure. We're kind of spoiled now up here. Yeah. Completely. <laughs> completely. So regarding Bayfield County, what makes this area so good for birding? There are a lot of things that really make Bayfield County great for birding. I mean, number one is the location along Lake Superior, so our geography. We're in kind of a northern part of Wisconsin that has a lot more wooded areas, a little more wild country, good areas for birds. But being in the north compared to, say, the southern part of the state, there's a lot more species that nest here, especially the warblers that a lot of people really like, very colorful, big group of 30-plus species that we have. The lake also is very important in kind of concentrating migrating birds. So if you think about birds migrating in the spring from the south, as they head north, they encounter that south shore of Lake Superior. And a lot of them don't want to fly over that. So instead, they kind of work along the shorelines and go around it. And as such, you end up with concentrations of birds here in Bayfield County that you don't get necessarily anywhere. But the single biggest reason why we have so many is the number of habitats we have. So if you want to find different kinds of birds, and a lot of them, you need different types of habitats for them to live in. And we have the water, we have wetlands, we have shorelines, we have uh, grasslands, we have lots and lots of forests of all different types. And you know what? We even have a type called the pine barrens, which are anything but barren at all. Yeah. These barrens are globally unique. There's only a few places in the world where you can find these barrens, and Wisconsin's one of them. And right here in Bayfield County, we have places like the Muckle Pine Barrens, as well as the Barnes Barrens south of Iron River. So having all those habitats is, is really key. And then we'll probably talk about it as well, but lots of public land in which to go and enjoy it all, which makes it real easy. That's really cool. So I'm guessing this is a great time of year to be birding. It is. It's a very good time. Spring is 
probably the favorite time for most bird watchers. We've had a long winter where we haven't really been hearing a whole lot outside. The birds have been few or a little antsy to get out there. And now we're going to have all these migrating birds coming back to either pass through our area or spend the, the summer nesting here. And the birds are in their most colorful plumages to get ready for that nesting season. So they're real pretty to look at. Many of them are singing. So it's very loud out there, and a lot of their songs are just kind of music to our ears to you know maybe hear that first robin that comes back. It's a fantastic time. In addition to that, you get to see a lot of maybe birds you wouldn't see other times a year as they're migrating north into Canada to where they're going to nest. You mentioned the warblers. What other kinds of birds can you see this time of year? Well, early in the year, it's a good time to look at a lot of waterfowl, ducks, geese, swans. And that's a good place for beginning bird watchers to get started. They tend to be bigger birds. They don't move around quite as much. Right. You can stand on the shore and look at them pretty easily. Fairly easily and stay with them. And then early in the season, we'll also see some of those what we call shorter distance migrants, ones that haven't migrated too far south of us. So things like robins or some of the grackles, sandhill cranes. Uh, great blue herons, things like that. Then later on, we're going to start to see some of the insect-eating birds come back when it gets a little bit warmer, and they can rely on those insects. And that's when we start to get some of these long-distance migrants coming back from where they're spending the winter all the way down in South America or Central America, which is pretty amazing. And that's what I think a lot of people get excited about because then we're starting to see our orioles again. We get to see our hummingbirds come back, our rose-breasted grosbeaks, a lot of those warblers. And that's when the woods really kind of become alive with with birds. And our bird feeders. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> are, are there any rare species up there? Oh, we have many rare species any given year. Some of them are rare from year to year. So in other words, like a federally endangered species, we have some Kirtland's warblers in a few spots in Bayfield County. We also have piping plover in portions of the Shawamigan Bay Area in Bayfield County. Last year, we had our first whooping crane that showed up. Oh wow, I didn't even um, hear that. It yeah. was only around it was only around for a day or two, but that was a, a first. And then you get these ones that are just kind of off course. <laughs> we call those vagrants and in the spring they they start to navigate their way back to where they want to be and they miss. <laughs> <laughs> and and they end up in our area and a lot of places get vagrants, but we do quite well. So we've had things like scissor-tailed flycatchers, Eurasian widgeon, which indeed comes from Europe and Asia. We have had Lewis's woodpeckers, which is a Western species. A number of ones that have only been seen three or four or five times in the state ever. And some of our rarest ones, I'm going to list three of them. One of them is a Wilson's plover, and that's typically a bird found on the Gulf Coast and portions of the Atlantic Coast. It's a shorebird. And it's only been found in Wisconsin twice, and one of them was here in, in Bayfield County. Wow. We also have uh, a bird called a tropical kingbird, which by its name suggests it's not supposed to be in Bayfield <laughs> County. <laughs> and we saw one a few years ago at the West End Park here in Washburn. And then another one was seen just a, a year later, also here on the Bayfield Peninsula. Those are the only two records in the whole state for that species. Wow. But taking the cake, the third one is a gull, believe it or not, which most people think Oh, they're hmm. just seagulls. There's yeah, actually there's so many, many of those, right? The, yeah, there are actually many different species, and some of them are very interesting. You're not going to find them just, you know, picking bread out of the dumpster. <laughs> there, there's a bird called a Ross's gull. It's extremely rare, very low population globally. It's typically found in the Arctic, the Bering Sea, portions of Russia, way up north. And most years, there's one seen in the entire United States. And one was seen here in the lower Schwamigan Bay back in 2001. And that's the only record for the state of Wisconsin. Wow. Of that species. So it's a really fun place to bird watch because you can see lots of common things, but there's always that hope that, hey, you know, <laughs> today I'm going to go out and there could be something that like isn't supposed to be here. This is going to be cool. Does the word go out on the street when there's one of these rare species out and about? Oh, it goes quickly. Yes, it goes <laughs> quickly. Whoever found it first, you know, usually starts the chain. And uh, it used to be by phone. Right. Uh, and now it's by text or Facebook or some other You'll have system. to let us know so we can put it out on our Facebook page if there's a rare species. It's called a rare bird alert. Nice. <laughs> so, Ryan, give us the inside scoop. Where do you go for the best birding? Well, where do I go? Uh, to be honest, I go in my yard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I own some property near Washburn here that does very well. I've seen over 190 species of birds right at my wow. own house. And I say that not to brag, but instead to point out that you can bird anywhere. You can bird in your backyard. You may not see 190 species, but you're going to see birds in your backyard almost anywhere you live. 
And that's one of the great things about birds. Aside from that, though, like I mentioned before, public lands, we just have so many opportunities. So I, I tend, I mean, it depends on the time of year and what I'm looking for, but I tend to really stick along the shoreline a lot when there's open water because of the chance of birds kind of concentrating there, but also because it's an interface of habitats. It's where habitats come together. So I can be looking out at water birds in front of me, but I can also be attuned to the land birds behind me or where I'm standing. And so that's a really good mix. So places like the West End Park or along the Washburn Lakeshore Trail or the Apostle Islands or Cornucopia and Bark Point are a few good examples. The Sea Caves Trail to the east of Cornucopia is very good for a lot of nesting warblers and other species. The Mukwa Barrens I mentioned. Some of the campgrounds are lakes out in the National Forest. Long Lake, Birch Grove. And all the hiking trails are great places North to Country bird. Trail is yeah. fantastic. And we have all kinds of little trails to do that on. And to be honest, the Ashland Lakefront is really, really good. The lower end of Shawamigan Bay, Prentice Park, Maslowski Beach, Fish Creek Sloughs, over to the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center. Those are all really good places to look for birds. And that doesn't even get into the southern parts of the county <laughs> where we have so much national forest and big inland lakes. Yeah. And, and some of the boggy areas about like black spruce, tamarack bogs, more boreal forest near Clam Lake over towards Cable. So just you can see I could go on and on and on yeah, about you all can. the this places. Is a great place to go birding. No, all no the doubt places about that. you can go look at birds. <laughs> so is there anything you can do in your own yard to make birds more attracted to come into your yard? Absolutely. There's some basic concepts, right? Food, water, and shelter. I think a lot of people might be in tune with that. And when we think of bird food, I think people immediately think of bird feeders. But I would argue that shouldn't be the first thing you should think of. You should be thinking about providing the natural foods that birds eat. And for many more species, that's insects or some sort of arthropods, uh, caterpillars, worms, larvae, those sorts of things. So the plants and trees. So you should be planting sure. uh, preferably native plants and trees that belong in the area that are going to host the most of those insects, that prey base, and that's how you will attract the most birds. At the same time, in addition to planting those natives, removing your invasive species, you know, things that shouldn't be there that are kind of taking over, limiting your pesticide use and you know, maybe not going full on organic, but that's not going to help with bugs, right? So use right. the native pest control. And you know what's good about that, using the natural animals and worms and things of that nature that are out there, is that we use bird seed and all we attract is more squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to have those squirrel-proof feeders. Feeders are good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to downplay the value of them, especially in the wintertime. Feeders are, are, are excellent. So people can do that, offer a variety of seeds, but you need to present it in a way where you can keep the squirrels and the bears I was gonna from say, getting to them. Come <laughs> spring, we have to put those away for a while, right? When the bears first wake up and... Yeah, or make them bear proof, which is very, very difficult, as everybody knows around here. So those are some food options. Water options, you know, a simple bird fountain can be very helpful. People tend to overlook water as a way to attract birds. You can attract almost any bird with a good source of water. Whereas putting on a bird feeder, you're only going to get maybe 20 species that tend to eat the seeds or suet that you're putting That's out. That's a great point. We have a pond in the back that fills up, you know, in the spring when everything's melting. And we, we do, we, it attracts so many birds. And then I don't think about the fact that later in the season, it would be good to maybe supplement that with some other water when that dries up. I have a fountain that you plug in. It has a pump that so it circulates that, and it's shallow water so the birds can get in it and bathe. You don't want the water too deep. And that is best from mid-July through September because there's still a lot of birds around, but it's the drier season. Uh huh. The heat has kind of dried things out, so it's a very good time to offer water to birds. And then lastly, I'd say shelter. You know, give places birds to live. Planting your native plants is going to help that. But also something like a brush pile, you know, instead hmm. of discarding or burning all those things— to be able to just stack a pile in the corner somewhere. It doesn't need to be huge. We actually put our Christmas tree out. You know, when you take <laughs> it down after Christmas, we put it out by the bird feeders. Yeah, that's a good idea. And those brush piles can just be really helpful. You, you'll you get so many birds in those brush piles, you'd be surprised. Huh. So which species have increased over the years? Well, increasing over the years. So yeah, those who have lived here for a while will probably notice there's a lot more bald eagles around, obviously. That's an easy one. They've done quite well. Another raptor that is no longer endangered, peregrine falcon. We don't see a lot of peregrine falcons in the county, but we have migrants, and they are nesting in Ashland now. Trumpeter swan is another one. People probably notice a lot more trumpeter swans. That's a real good success story. 
We have pears nesting throughout portions of the county, especially southern part of the county. It's always exciting when we see the swans come in the spring. Yeah. Yeah, They're so beautiful. And they really have done well taken to various water bodies, inland lakes, beaver ponds, and so forth. Canada geese are another one. We have a lot more geese around now. Sandhill cranes are another one that has really increased. And uh, turkeys, holy cow. Oh my gosh, they're everywhere. Yes, oh, and they're mean. <laughs> we have so many turkeys now. I don't know if they're, are they mean? I've never well, encountered one mean. up close. I, mm. I wouldn't call them mean. We see them as we're driving around, so we don't really get in, into the nitty gritty. We'll get out and see what they do to you. <laughs> when they come into the city in Milwaukee, they actually will chase you. Oh, see, they're oh, fighting for city, their territory. That's city yeah, turkeys. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there must be a gang of turkeys. <laughs> we got the we got the country turkeys up here. Kinder, kinder. Much more laid back. What about species that are declining? Decliners. Eastern whippoorwill. Uh, if you may be familiar with oh. the incessant oh. calling of the whippoorwill, that's the call that we use to find each other in big stores. Our family, when we've lost each other in a big store, we call the whippoorwill. So oh, we that's can so find funny, each Mary. Other. That's what we whippoorwill. <laughs> right. That's what we use when we're talking about somebody and they come close to us. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. Most people have a whippoorwill, you know, hey, it's a whippoorwill, you know, they're kind of excited to hear it. And then they just go on and on. And <laughs> you're like, oh middle, my God. By the time you get to, you know, an hour or two later, you're like, oh my God, get rid of this whippoorwill. <laughs> I even have a t-shirt that says hashtag whippoorwill. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. They have declined quite a bit. And, and similarly, there's another closely related bird, the common nighthawk, which isn't a hmm. hawk at all. It's also a, a, a night jar like the whippoorwill is. It, it eats insects, flying insects. And so both of those have declined. Some of it is habitat related. It's not as simple, but declines in flying insect populations are thought to be a real big driver of that. We have many fewer flying insects, non-mosquito things. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> non-mosquitoes. Isn't that a good um, thing? No. <laughs> moths. You know, if you think about moths, you remember in... You know, 20, 30, 50 years ago, for some people can remember driving down the road in the summer and your windshield would just be splattered with bugs. That doesn't happen a whole lot anymore. And so those are real key prey sources for those birds. Evening grosbeak is another one. Uh, Listeners may remember having uh, big flocks of evening grosbeaks coming to their bird feeders. They're a finch type species that comes in the winter bright yellow they come in flocks really pretty they're very pretty they eat a lot of sunflower seeds at a time Uh, (laughs) and they have declined over the last you know 30 years especially and then there's a few others I, i i won't list them all but grassland birds really come to mind many of our grassland species are in trouble a lot of grasslands are being lost to development or conversion to agriculture and things like upland sandpipers and eastern meadowlarks and bobolinks Northern Harriers. These are all grassland birds, which historically we didn't have a lot of grasslands here, obviously, in Bayfield County. But those are birds that haven't been doing well as we lose those habitats, not only here in the county, but broader in both the state and the country. I'm always sad to hear when there's a decline in certain populations. What can we do to help the birds? Well, there's a lot of different things you can help. We talked about, you know, kind of at the local scale, what you could do in in your backyard, some of those things that you could offer. You know, I would say you could go a step further. You can become active in conservation organizations. I'm part of a group called the Wisconsin Bird Conservation Initiative, and that's a voluntary partnership of organizations kind of working together towards that common goal of, of saving birds. But there's similar entities doing other things, something like Audubon chapters, and we do have a local one here in the Shawamigan Audubon chapter that does good work for birds. And some of that you know comes in a variety of ways. It might be through fundraising. It might be through education and awareness. It might come through field trips. Aren't there some like volunteer bird counts people can sign up to do? Yep, you can get involved with citizen science, and that's one of the things that I also help coordinate. And, you know, there's something like a Christmas bird count would be a good example. We have three or four of those in, in the county come the Christmas season, and people can get involved and help count birds. But even outside of those organized events, you can even take your sightings of birds and make them valuable. There's something called eBird. So just ebird.org, and it's an online system for reporting your bird observations. So instead of maybe writing it in your journal or maybe in addition to, you go online. And you share it. And you can report what you saw there. And imagine, you don't have to imagine because it's happening, but millions of people using that. And 
all that data going in and then scientists and researchers and conservationists being able to utilize that information to, nice. do, to do good things for birds. Well, we'll try to put some of that information into our show notes so that people can uh, kind of look those things up and, and help you out there. Yeah, if I could add, if sure. you don't mind, there's also the Great Wisconsin Birdathon, and this is a way to raise money for really important bird conservation projects in the state. And so this is a statewide birdathon. It's kind of like a walkathon where you, if you wish, you can raise money from friends and family based on how many birds you see. That's awesome. So maybe awesome. instead of miles walked, it's per species. I love maybe it. Maybe a quarter oh, a species great idea. or a dollar a species, or they could just donate a lump sum. But the idea is you go out for a day, maybe with some friends in the springtime, and you you know see how many birds you can find, and then collect your pledges. And then we have a number of teams doing that throughout the state. And as such, you can raise tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars that go towards bird conservation. Very cool. That is neat. And if you can't participate, uh, you know, by forming a team and collecting pledges yourself, you can donate to that effort. So I'm part of a team that's called the Lake Superior eBirders. And we go out every year, uh, a few of us, and do this usually in late May. And it's it's a ton of fun. We wake up at like 2 in the morning. Oh, yeah. And then we just go nonstop until about <laughs> 7 at night. And usually we see like 160-some species of birds, almost all of them in Bayfield County. Wow. Okay, so there's another big, very fun thing coming up, and that's your Birding in Nature Festival. Can you tell us about that? Yes, the Birding in Nature Festival. That has become one of the marquee events in, in the upper Midwest, frankly, and certainly within the state. We have, let's see, 13 years now that this one will, will be coming up. It's May 16th through 18th, and that's a three-day festival. That includes presentations, field trips, a few workshops, and it's first and foremost about birds. But wow, we have so many different things. We, we really try to give a, a wide diversity of experiences with that festival. There's things, uh, birds and plants and mammals and butterflies and frogs, and there's paddling trips and there's bird banding. There's photography outings. There's over 120 unique activities that you can do over that three-day period. It's, it's so cool. It's, it's my favorite event that happens, honestly. I just love the fact that you can have all of these experts leading these field trips, taking you out, and you have these very small groups with one-on-one -on -one contact with, with people that really know what they're doing. So if you're a novice, it's the perfect opportunity to get out there and really try things out and, and see all that there is to see and do here without having to know where you're going even. That's what makes this, the festival so great. I mean, obviously we have a great venue and we have good birds, but it's those experts that we have that, yes. that make it what it is. We have almost 70 of those individuals who are involved in leading trips or doing presentations. They're from the Forest Service. They're from the Park Service, the Fish, Fish and, and Wildlife, Wildlife Service. Yep. They're maybe not part of some government agency. They're part of a nonprofit or the Landmark Conservancy, whatever it might be. They're experts in that field, and they're willing to share that expertise with you. And so you learn not only about critters or wildlife you're interested in, but you also get led to all these wonderful places. You don't have to necessarily find them on your own. You're being shown. And so right. it's... It's really grown quite a bit. I, I think that first year we might have had 100 and some people, and now we usually have close to 400 people that come wow. for that event. It usually fills up, doesn't it? Like all the events, you have to sign up for them ahead of time. It does. The field trips are most popular, and usually they kind of hit their maximum. Um, so you do have to make sure that you, you register. So you would go to birdandnaturefest.com. And that's where you would find bird festival information. And yeah, the sooner the better if you want to get in on, on these events. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Ryan. Here's to a great birding season, right? Absolutely. Can't Cheers. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then coming up next, Mary is going to give us the scoop on what spring events action is happening in Bayfield County. So don't go away. Family owned and operated, Bayfront Inn is in beautiful Bayfield, Wisconsin, between the Bayfield City Dock and Madeline Island Ferry Line. So close to the water, it's the perfect lodging choice for anyone planning on enjoying activities on Lake Superior or for those who just want to relax and hear the gentle sound of rolling waves. Bayfront Inn has 16 rooms and suites with private lakeview balconies and modern amenities. Its on site restaurant, the Pier Plaza, is known around town for its famous fresh fish fries daily specials, and a fully stocked bar. The Bayfront Inn, the only thing they overlook is the water. 
to plan your vacation at the Bayfront Inn, call 715-779-3330 or visit online at bayfrontinbayfield.net. With a friendly staff, a cozy cabin-like atmosphere, and outstanding food, the Bear Paw Restaurant is a must for any hungry Bayfield County traveler. Serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner, daily specials include chicken wings, seafood, and barbecued ribs. Stop in for a hearty omelet and try their sweet treats, including pies, cookies, and incredible caramel rolls, or dig into a tasty burger or sandwich. Don't forget a side of their delicious and unique homemade potato chips. Seniors 60 and over can stop in Tuesdays from 2 to 4 for a delicious homemade meal. The Bear Paw Restaurant, located at the corner of State Highway 13 and County A in Port Wayne, Wisconsin. Find them on Facebook or give them a call at 715-774-3670. We are back. Mary, what can you tell us about April in Bayfield County? What's going on? You know, April is probably our least busy month in terms of events, but we still have some really fun ones going on. It starts off with Syrup Saturday at the Iron River National Fish Hatchery. And if you've never been to one of these, it's a great opportunity to get out and learn how to tap trees to make maple syrup. So, you know, you walk around and learn how the process works. And then at the end, you get to actually try some maple syrup on ice cream. So it, oh, yum. <laughs> even if you don't like maple syrup, I thought you were going to say we all get to walk away with our own bottle of maple syrup. No, no, no. <laughs> Plenty of places to get it up here, but um, no, you get to try it out on ice cream. So yeah, if even if you don't think you're a maple syrup fan, I guarantee you're probably going to like it on ice cream. Yeah, it sounds delicious. <laughs> and then that same weekend, there's a cellar jazz concert at the White Winter Winery. And it's a really fun event that they've put together. They kind of make it like a speakeasy. And so there's games and jazz music going on. And it's just a really fun event. And that actually is also in Iron River at at the White Winter Winery. Okay. And then to end the month, we've got the Washburn Broke Down Blues Fest at the Harborview Event Center in Washburn. (laughs) And that's actually, I think, a two-day event. Yeah, it's the 26th and 27th of April. And, uh, And so there's music all day long, all evening long. They have food catered in from the Delta Diner. It's just a really, really fun, fun event. Yeah, a good place to do a little flat footing. Do you ever do that? (laughs) I don't know if I have. (laughs) It's fun. I'm originally from Virginia, so flat footing is a big thing Uh, down there. You'll have to show me how. Yeah, we love that at Bluegrass Festival. So nice. Anything else we should know about Mary? Now, just to make sure, this is blues and not bluegrass. Oh, okay, okay. And then I was wrong. <laughs> so we'll have to do flat footing at a different festival. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you gotta you gotta like the blues to come to this one. Gotcha. <laughs> so that's uh, that's what's happening as far as events in April. Of course, it's a great time to get out and about and look for those birds like Ryan was talking about. And if you want to find out any more about what you'd like to do in the area, whether it's in April or any other time of the year, make sure to go to TravelBayfieldCounty.com and check out those interactive maps, which have all of the lodging and dining and attractions on there. And then also the Facebook page for Bayfield County Tourism is where we're going to have any last minute events that get added in and updates and things that are happening. That sounds great. And what are you going to be talking about next month? Next month, we really are going to talk with Emily Stone this time, who is a naturalist at the Cable Natural History Museum. That's great. I'll, I'm going to look forward to that. Thank you so Me much, too. Mary. You are welcome. And to everyone listening, if you like what you've heard today, we would really love your support. So please take a moment to share, review, and subscribe to Bayfield County Wild. If there's anything you'd like to know about today's episode, we'll have all the links and resources available in our show notes. And on behalf of Mary and myself, thank you for listening to Bayfield County Wild. Bye-bye. <laughs>